Hello and welcome to the Direct Spans. I'm Mitch the Quack and I hope you're having a less quack day than myself. Today we're technically going to be talking about the Drust. Again. Why? Well, because at this point I feel like I'm trying to piss off Steve the News Hunter. I mean, I'm not trying, but yeah. This theory is either going to make the lore about the Drust, or at least the power behind them, way more complex than it should be, or it's going to reveal a connection that I'm pretty certain is supposed to be a surprise. God, I'm being arrogant today. With that said, Here's the random question that technically explains everything, with context. When was the last time you visited Winter Spring? Okay, so context. The Lost Codex for the BlizzCon did an interview with Steve Benuza. If you haven't watched it, go watch it, and sub while you're at it. I mean, the last time I looked, the top comment was something like, Lost Codex, always there with the important questions. It's accurate. The two questions we're focusing on are the ones about the Drust. And to avoid spoiling the exact answers in the interview, the long story short is, Cynic in me says Blizz is still deciding on what to do with the Drust, Quack in me says they know precisely what they're doing with them, but answering any questions about them equates to spoilers. As you can assume, we're obviously listening to the Quack. So, the overall takeaway from the interview was, the Drust we are fighting are likely not the first Drust, or more precisely, the Drust we are seeing now are specifically related to Gorak Tull and his machinations, however the power they tapped into is older, darker and likely something we'll learn about later on in the story. So, the obvious question is, has someone else tapped into this power before? And from there, the who, why, etc, etc. I think the answer is yes, as there are indications the Shadowlands has encountered the Drust before. The proof being the Fey know of the Drust, but as legends, as well as Toothpick from the Abomination Factory, who states as a part of the weekly quest Old Stomping Ground, they journey to Ardenwield to put down a threat long forgotten, or quite possibly a threat relegated to legend. The other takeaway from the interview is Gorak Tall did not interact with an eternal one to gain his power. Now does this disprove the hidden history of the Drust and the idea that there was a great being connected to Thross? Well once again it's kind of a question of cynic or quack. Cynic? Yes, leave the man alone. You completely understand the context of the question and the situation. Simply put, Thross is Thross. The end. Quack, on the other hand, why did he specifically say Eternal One, when it's been made pretty clear that that is a title only used to describe the entities in the Pantheon of Death, and not other possible entities and pantheons in the universe? Anyway, I highly suggest you watch the interview to gain your own opinion on the answers. For this theory, I'll be going down the quacked routes, in particularly the first route relating to there being some form of prehistoric drust. So, with that established, we now move to Bastion. Yes, Bastion. Specifically to the stewards, Swalkin. Why? Well, ever since I and many others first saw the little owls, the first thought to come to our minds was, huh, is that what a boomkin slash moonkin slash owlkin slash laser chicken is supposed to look like? I still haven't gotten the answer, however what this question prompted was an excursion to Winter Spring. If you don't know where I'm talking about, Winter Spring is the northeasternmost zone in Kalimdor, just north of Ajara and east of Hyjal. The reason I went to the zone is because, fun fact, if you ever do research on what the Alkin are, you'll always end up in Winter Spring. The reason why is because in vanilla there is a questline that relates to the gem of a loon that explains the Alkin were sent by a loon to protect the places and things of importance to the goddess. Now we learn all this information in a region called Alwyn Thicket, and in Cataclysm this specific subzone of Winter Spring, from what I can tell, changed. Three caves with three specific totems inside were added to the zone. One totem contained the essence of the claw, another the essence of life, and the other the essence of the moon. Each of these totems also have an animal connected to them. Claw, a bear, life, a deer, and the moon, an owl. The implication here is that each totem represents what creatures the Moonkin were made out of, as in the Alkin are seemingly an amalgamation of an owl, a bear, and a deer. So, so far so good. These are pretty easy dots to connect. At this point however, this is where things start to get quacked. As you'll notice, each of the totems don't really match the animals assigned to them. That isn't a bear paw print, the scarecrow obviously is humanoid, and that handprint likely didn't come from an owl. Or did they? Starting with the most obvious considering the context of this theory, the handprint. Stewards aren't exactly a typical type of owl. You know, being able to talk, 
and being humanoid. However, what is very interesting is that stewards have four fingers and a hand shape like the handprint on the totem. Next, we look at the paw. Obviously not a bear paw print, but then the question becomes, what type of creature has feet even remotely similar to this mark? Well, other than the obvious being an Alkin, have you ever looked at a Gorgon's feet recently? As in the stone bears in Revendreth? They just happen to have three toes. And where I wouldn't say their feet are the exact same feet as the paw print, a little bit of nuance and some flesh shaping later fills in the gaps quite nicely. I'll get back to the flesh shaping later. This leads us to the Scarecrow, and considering what I started this theory off with, I think you can imagine where this is going. Do I think Goraktul's Drust were the first to tap into the dark aspects of winter and autumn within life magic? No. Do I think there was a group of some form of prehistoric Drust that attacked Ardenwield and assumedly were defeated by the combined forces of the Fey and Maldraxxus? Yes. And what do I think happened to these prehistoric Drust? Well, I think they got transformed into the Moonkin by being fused with Gorgon and Stewards and were sent to Azeroth by Loon to act as the guardians of Loon's sacred places. Why? Well, considering the Drust of Present seemingly gained their power, or at least their horns because they sacrificed a stag, which we learned from their steelies, the fact Athaia, the white stag in Drustvar, carries the title Heart of the Forest, and in the Bastion campaign, we get a very good idea of how the Heart of the Forest in Ardenwild was created, and what it is. I would not be surprised if these prehistoric Drust, possibly during whatever instant got Zorval locked up, quote-unquote killed the original Heart of the Forest in Ardenwild. Or, all things considered, quote-unquote killed the Winter Queen's Athain. The Heart of the Forest being the only way to preserve whatever was left of that soul, and the transformation into Moonkin possibly being some form of practical punishment. That said, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Did Loon genuinely help her sister to that extent, considering the apparent state of their relationship? Or does this incident have something to do with why Loon doesn't seem to be present in the Shadowlands anymore, and possibly what saw the Night Warrior used on Azeroth to begin with? I mean, here's something to ponder. Aluneth, the talking weapon for Arcane Mages back in Legion, just happened to mention the Night Elves had the potential to rival the Titans. An interesting statement considering we know the Eternal Ones are supposed to be Titan-like in power. Makes you wonder what would have happened if the Elves had ever met the Eternal Ones. Or more interestingly, considering who their goddess is, and the Highborn's complete lack of self-control during the Kaldori Empire, why isn't there any reference of their meeting? I mean, I know they didn't touch Hyjal because Azara apparently knew better. However, would Hyjal have really been the only place on Azeroth that hypothetically had connections to the Shadowlands? Though thinking about it, the Temple of Elude and the Broken Isles do seemingly have those connections to death. And the Shadowlands. But anyway, if you're curious about how the transformation of the Drust likely happened, consider this. What is one of the crafts the Maldraxxi are masters of? And quite specifically, what was needed to empower the Kyrian's Crest of Ascension? Answer. Flesh Shaping and the Heart of Margrave Garmal, which OG Mograine just happened to mention has the ability to Flesh Shape. I mentioned the Crest of Ascension by the way because the Kyrian campaign seemingly goes out of its way to imply Ascending Kyrian are only possible with the combined powers of all the Covenants, which I find intriguing considering I'm still convinced Alun has something to do with Bastion, and Alun is specifically connected to the creation of the Moonkin, which assuming this theory is correct, would have also needed the combined powers of the Covenants to be created, or at least aspects of each Covenant were used in their creation. And on flesh shaping, here's another question I would ask. Does that connection explain why Druids can shapeshift into Moonkin as a form? Or possibly just shapeshift overall? But anyway, do you get the intro now? I've either completely overcomplicated the Drust and the Moonkin, or by my best guess, Considering we're getting a Broken Dungeon and a Torghast rate in 9.1, there is a very good chance in 9.2 or 9.3 we are going to get some hint and or just outright explanation behind where the Moon King came from and the Shadowlands connection to Azeroth. A possible twist attached to that reveal being the Moon King were once some form of prehistoric Drust. As in the Winter Queen wasn't joking when she said that the Drust could have served the Wilds. Because if this theory is correct, she was specifically referencing the Moonkin. And yes, where the Winter Queen could have made the Moonkin, and in turn, that would imply she is a loon, I personally don't think she did. However, I do think she was present for their creation. Now, we're not done yet. 
You see, laser chickens wouldn't be much of a laser chicken without, well, you know, the laser. So the question is as follows. Where in the world does all this moonkin, solar, and lunar affinity come from? And where I know the obvious answer and just answer is a loon, you can actually find a very interesting dynamic between the stewards and a lot of the creatures found in Ardmill and Bastion, which demonstrate what I can only describe as a solar and lunar separation. As in the stewards are separated by a gold and silver aesthetic, the feathered dragons are also separated by a blue and orange aesthetic. These two are the most obvious examples, however there are a lot more in each zone. However, the main point here is there seems to be lunar and solar undertones in Ardenwield and Bastion. So assuming Loon was and or is above all the Eternal Ones, the laser aspect of the laser chickens makes sense. If the Moonkin were a Loon's direct creations, then it seems like she used another yet to be named aspect of the Shadowlands in their creation. Though what I will add is if there is a solar and lunar separation between these creatures, I do think it's possible not all of the Moonkin were created by a loon, and some may have been created by Anshi. For what purpose? I don't know. They could have a similar purpose to his sister's Moonkin, or they may serve another purpose. All I'm really willing to say is that there is a very real chance they may have been a form of Drust prior to their transformation. To also add another connection to the Shadowlands presence on Azeroth that slightly reinforces the idea the zones have connections to each other, what creatures native to Azeroth, overall Hydral, and specifically Winter Spring and Kind of Ashen Vale make no sense in their relation to nature and purpose, and also just happen to be native to Maldraxxus. Answer, the Chimera. In Maldraxxus, the Chimera's existence makes perfect sense. On Azeroth, not so much. However, when you start to notice a few things about the Chimera in Maldraxxus, specifically their hatred of bugs, you start to realise why they may have been imported to Azeroth and why they innately defend Hyjal and the surrounding areas. There is just obviously a blatant amount of questions that come with that idea. Okay, so now we're moving on to the second part of this theory that kind of required the context given so far to make sense. Though, I really do need to preface this by saying this is an incredibly quacked theory and to say there is a substantial lack of evidence for what I'm about to say would be a complete understatement. And so with that said, Winter Spring, despite being relatively barren with quests, may have a lot more story within the zone than first appears. What am I talking about? Well, firstly, Starfall Village. Where does the name come from? It's been made pretty clear, especially with vanilla zones, a vast portion of the locations and names have some form of lore behind them. A prime example being Bashel Aran and Amethoran in Darkshore, and the story of the twins. Now, I'm not sure when, who, what, or why this may have happened, but I have a sneaking suspicion that something related to the Shadowlands fell from the sky in the region of Winter Spring, specifically at Lake Kelthoril, hence the Starfall and Starfall Village, the lake being there in the first place, and depending on what fell, possibly the hot springs of Winter Spring. Whatever fell in the region, I think the elves and or possibly the dark trolls found, and being mortals, they innately started playing with it. Now, depending on whether what fell in Winter Spring was sentient or not, I can see a few different outcomes happening, but they all have one thing in common. Similar to the Well of Eternity, whatever fell in Winter Spring had a profound effect on the trolls slash elves, and I think it may have made them shockingly aware of the Shadowlands like more so than we think, and that they let on. I mean, Shandris turns up in the Shatlands, and it was made clear in, in, oh, I forget whose interview, that NPCs making it to the Shatlands likely went to extreme lengths to get into the Shatlands. Now there is obviously an argument to be made that Shandris just talked to some Death Knights and arrived in Arboros and eventually ended up in Arnwheel. However, when we consider we know the Tauren were aware of the Shadowlands and had explicitly connected it to the Moon, Malorn, and Scenarius, I highly doubt the Elves didn't have similar information, and quite possibly believed Loon would guide their souls to her side upon death, regardless of whatever process was active within the Shadowlands. I mean, thinking about it, if I want to be really quacked, and I mean like really, really quacked, I could just argue the gem of Loon is what fell, and it was the catalyst that sparked the Dark Trolls' magical ascension, eventually leading to their transformation into elves. 
I mean, hell, depending on when Alun entered the Troll Pantheon of Loa, that event and the gem may have been the catalyst for her worship on Azeroth. Which, crazily enough, if you go by the in-game book The Twin Empires, which places the Dark Trolls as a subsect of the Armani Trolls, that broke off possibly some time after and or during the troll Akir War, you also possibly get the event that sparked the separation and divergence in their pantheons. And where I know the instant response to everything I just said is, doesn't that theory heavily, heavily contradict the Chronicles? Technically, no. Firstly, on the Elves' transformation, after Suramar and the Arkandor, where we basically grow a tree that bears fruit which allows the Nightfall to change into Nightborn, that also directly ties the Elves before Druidism and is heavily implied to have something to do with the Loon, I feel like it's been made pretty clear where the World of Eternity was definitely the power source which allowed for the transformation from Troll to Elf. The direct catalyst that allowed this change was seemingly something else. If the gem of Elune really did contain her wisdom, and Elune has as much of a connection to the Shadowlands as she appears to, then would it really be that far-fetched to think the Dark Trolls gleamed some form of knowledge about Covenants and their powers, and in turn, attempted to use them? I mean, I mentioned flesh crafting being related to shapeshifting, even though we know Cenarius is the one who taught the Elves Druidism, but at the same time, it's kind of strange Ardenwood focuses on soul shaping slash soul shifting, not shape-shifting, which assumedly has more to do with flesh and quite possibly has the ability to be more permanent. So I guess firstly, it would be interesting if druidic shape-shifting had a connection to both soul-shaping and flesh-crafting, and in regards to this theory, it would be rather interesting if one or both has something to do with the transformation of the elves. I mean, considering what's going on with Anduin and the Jailer, it would be rather interesting if the creation of the Children of the Stars was a lot more sinister than we know. Now, moving back to which tribe the Dark Trolls came from and why that also doesn't contradict Chronicle, the Trolls' history and the war with the Akir starts at 16,000 BDP, or at least is dated that far back. And the Elves' origin is apparently dated back to 15,000 to 10,000 BDP. So where all the tribes were definitely Zandalari at one point, how they split into significantly different tribes has quite a few leeways in how it may have happened, and what tribes turn into others. Especially when you consider certain lower have been forgotten, others have risen to prominence, and other lower have caused massive splinters in existing troll tribes. And when you compare the Armani pantheon of Loa to the Night Elven Wild Gods, it's rather interesting that in comparison to every other troll tribe, there is a shocking amount of overlap in the creatures they worship. Oh, and actually, thinking about it, of course the elves were aware of the Shadowlands. They were trolls after all, and they once upon a time worshipped the lower. I guess to make this theory a bit more precise, whatever possibly fell in Winter Spring, whether it be the Gem of Loon or not, Sentient or not, may have opened the way for the Dark Trolls to start interacting with the Shadowlands in a similar way they eventually began interacting with the Emerald Dream, and or taught them aspects of the Covenant's magics, which assumedly eventually led to the creation of the Elven Empire on Azeroth. But regardless, this is an excessively big assumption, with the only proof being the Gem of Loon apparently contained the Wisdom of Loon, which may have included ways to wield the magics of the Shadowlands and or other things which kicked off the advancement of the Dark Trolls. But simultaneously, I can't even safely say there was an object that fell from the Shadowlands into Winter Spring. So if you take this second part of the theory with a grain of salt, I completely understand. And finally, just as a bit of a tease for what the next podcast is going to be about. The Gem of Loon, what does it look like? I personally think it's a low res, properly cut version of this. If you are watching the screen right now and agree with the comparisons I have just made, yeah, my mind began to implode as well. When was the last time you visited Winter Spring? Thank you for watching.